one of the many pleasures and benefits of working on this book last year was taking time to focus on the importance of touch. COVID restrictions separating us from each other had heightened my awareness of the essential human need to be in touch, to be touched, to keep in touch, and to touch. Individuals devised various ways to cope. However, most distressing was when loved ones became seriously ill or died. Conventional rituals had to be delayed or reimagined as we struggled to invent satisfying ways to be with or without each other. Being in touch with Chester for us began over 50 years ago. However, we'll begin right here at the Meeting House, September 15th, 2019, with a presentation by Al Malpa. Peter and I were away at the time. However, scheduled to present our own work two months later, it behooved us to watch Al's presentation. Fortunately, Jean-Claude Haynes, thank you Jean-Claude, wherever you are, uh, he had already posted a YouTube version on the Historical Society's website. Close-ups of the ephemera and the option to stop and focus on any frame was an easy and convenient way to be right there. Each time I revisit Al's presentation, which I've done a number of times, working on the book and even recently working, getting prepared for this presentation, uh, each time I re revisited it, uh, I was more and more appreciative of Al's expertise, and Ephemera's ability to reveal unique cultural and historical perspectives. <coughs> and Peter might want to join me now with his ideas about um, Jen and I started collecting Ephemera when we first met uh, 57 years ago. And um, it was, at that time, it wasn't called ephemera, it was called junkie. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we used to go to various places near the university. Uh, one I remember is Alex's Glassworks in Norwich. And uh, they were essentially like uh, 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 flea markets in a way. Uh, we, we had no money, so we just uh, went to look and pick up a few things here and there. Uh, and we were interested as visual artists uh, and as visual communicators in uh, the various period uh, techniques that were used on, on uh, uh, early 19th century, uh, early 20th century of, of print material, uh, packaging, toys, uh, photo albums, uh, a piece of sheet music here and there. Uh, I still have some uh, sweet caporal uh, tobacco baseball cards uh, that I that I picked up in one of those uh, chances. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the homeless Wagner card, <laughs> which just sold for a quarter of a million dollars. I think. Uh, most of the things we had were, were inexpensive, and uh, throughout our years, we've we've always collected it, and uh, many were used in, in collages and so forth. And the thing about ephemera is it does give you a glimpse into another period of time. They're like many time capsules in a way. And uh, most of them were not, uh, the pieces that we collected were not really uh, monumental times, no uh, presidential elections. They were uh, more quotidian, more the everyday items that somehow 
told a story of a, of a, of a particular time or, or a trend or a fashion at that time that have disappeared. And in our life, <coughs> in our lifetime, there are many kinds of ephemera that we have seen come and go because of the technology. For example, phone directories. Remember when we used to get one every year? And throw the old one out. Uh, they always were hanging from phone booths. Remember phone booths? Uh, <laughs> uh, so there's many things like that that tell a story about the way people lived, the way they communicated. And um, uh, that is what attracted us. The, the typography that was used, the printing techniques that were used, uh, whether it's the, uh, the hand touring of leather on an old photo album, uh, and, and just uh, a, a lot of other uh, elements that uh, enrich our visual uh, <coughs> understanding of, of, of our, uh, the, the richness of, uh, of our life and the history. It also gives us a sense of continuity with the past. Uh, so, um, you know, do you want Sixteen months after Al's presentation, his untimely death resulted in a shock and confusion. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Carrie's family organized a Zoom memorial so friends near and far could express their love for and share stories about this remarkable man. However, I wanted to do something more lasting. Fascinated with what I had learned about ephemera from Al, and remembering Peter's and my decades of collaborating with Carrie on Chester history books, the answer came easily. Skip Hubbard's enthusiasm for the historical society to publish a book based on Al's presentation was all we needed to begin. When I first met Al in 2000, he had never been to Chester. From his first time here, he absolutely loved this town, and he always talked about how wonderful it is. He also loved ephemera, and he actually has given two programs on ephemera to the Historical Society. One was a slideshow back in the early 2000s. Um, in the first floor of what then became our museum. It was a crowded room, and as always, Al was charming and funny and knowledgeable. Al would be so proud and honored to be remembered in Chester by this beautiful book that Jan and Peter have created. And so he had to make an appearance today. <laughs> so, <laughs> His medal, his Marcus Reward, Marcus Ricard's Award medal that he got from the Ephemera Society of America. He was told shortly before his death that he had been selected for the honor, <coughs> but he didn't get the award until, um, well, until I got it. And so anyway, um, there was a dinner two weeks ago um, from the given by the Ephemera Society of America, and Al made his appearance there, <laughs> thanks to a friend, and so here he is, so keep going. <laughs> so, as we go, as we went forward, excited about the book, we learned that more than half of the items included in Al's talk were actually just a ephemera which we could feature in the book. And Diane, bless her soul, <laughs> and her expertise, she provided me with a detailed, comprehensive list of all of the particular items that were in Al's talk that were Chester. And um, the Freddie Bogart calling card featured on this very first slide was one of them. And Diane, you might want to talk about the other discoveries that are on that spread. Um, actually, these, most of these calling cards um, that are up on the screen were collected by Nesta Walden, who some of you may remember, and who after 
a while, she ended up giving them to the <coughs> Lieberman, who in turn donated them to the Historical Society about three or four years ago. Um, and what's interesting is the, um, many of them probably were printed in Chester. There were two different places that printed cards like this. Um, back in the 1880s and 90s, there was a place out near where Skip Hubbard lives in Laurel. There's one right here. Um, that um, was called the Standard Card Company, run by Tom Gandy. And then later, there was the Patacom Printing Company, and you'll see the receipt on the screen. And that was the early 1900s. The date on this one is 1912. And we actually got this piece from, um, it was a bill for uh, Ruth Norton, who graduated from Chester High School in 1912. And this was probably her cards that she gave out after graduation. Um, and her family had collected a bunch of things from Ruth and donated them to the Cheshire Historical Society <laughs> instead of Chester. <laughs> and Cheshire <laughs> passed them on to us. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. Uh, going forward, we realize that images for the book uh, require, I, re I realize, require different files than those that are prepared normally for PowerPoint. So I asked Diane for more help. She searched through the archives and provided me with all of the original items. We, at this point, just have the visuals, the files. Um, and of course, she carefully identified a number of each one, which you will see in the book, too, the careful numbering that she does. Now, for my part, wanting the printed imagery to look and feel like the actual items, I photographed each one in natural daylight with my little iPhone. People said, how could you possibly do that? Well, my iPhone is quite amazing for me anyway. Uh, and for me, I wanted to create the sense of touching a surface, texture and edge. I feel that's essential to one's appreciation of the ephemera. And to that effect, while planning the book's dimensions and number of pages, Peter and I decided that it should be small enough to comfortably hold in your hands, yet have pages large enough so that at least some of the items could be reproduced actual size. And I bring up this particular slide because those little tickets are produced actual size in the book, and it gives you a sense. I always felt if you reproduce something life-size, it has more of a real feel to it. And I also noticed, and I just talked to Diane about, uh, one of the things that was wonderful about Al's talk, is in, his, in his PowerPoint, he showed a photograph of the 1911 Cedar Club Pleasure Club or Orchestra, which I was delighted to hear there was a Cedar Club orchestra. And Al had shown in his PowerPoint the names of all of the musicians, and Diane knows them very well. Well, this is um, a la large part of the Stahl family. Um, John Meyer, who was on this end, was a cousin. And uh, the next one is Roland Line. And then there's Henry, Arthur, Maurice, and Bill Stahl, and Frank Westcott. So, you know, it was a very much a family place. And I think it was probably a cottage that was right on the lake, possibly near where, I'm not sure that it's Bill Myers' cottage, but it's over in that area somewhere. And speaking of the tickets, the tickets are something that um, Tom Brelsford found, and they are for the Princess Theater, which is what Fort Water Street is now. Thank you again, Diane. I love, I love depending on her. Her knowledge. Okay. I, did, I just want to make a comment on, on the photography. Of, uh, Jan would go from room to room following the sun or the flower <laughs> or the light uh, to, to capture the, the changing light and try to get the light as natural as possible. Uh, and what we 
discovered that it is so important are the edges, the little rips, the tears, uh, the, the stains of, on the paper, which gives it a authenticity. In other words, you, we wanted to capture the, uh, the actual feel of the piece itself. Thank you. So again, early on in the process of gathering these items, we discovered that in order to have a substantial look, first idea was, oh, you know, it could be 30, 40 pages, that's enough, it doesn't have to be that big. But the more excited, especially I got about the potential, we wanted to make it bigger. And um, so again, I go back to Diane, and she broadened her search of the archives, and I've shown this a few photographs of what, what these archives, I don't know if people have visited the archives recently or ever, but it's quite an experience to see the organization, the extent of organization and material that is so and carefully. I, I don't know if you know where the archives are. They are down under the stage. Um, we have a room downstairs where we have, where we work, and um, we have several computers down there. We use a museum uh, software, Past Perfect, and we have every item. This is our goal, to have every item in the computer with a picture so that we can keep track of everything. Um, I think she caught us on a rather uh, unorganized day. <laughs> But, you know, people bring things in, and by the time you get it organized and find where you're going to go, it, they end up sitting there for a while, so. How about the hours, Diane? Pardon? The hours. How about the hours? Oh, well, I'm there on Tuesdays from 1 to 3, and on Fridays from 9 to 12, most any day, or you can contact me, and I will meet you at another time if that works for you. And my co-worker is pictured in there. She's had her head down so we can't see her, but it's Pat Kosky, so thank you. Yay, Pat. We became uh, really fascinated with the typography, being, being designers. Uh, the annual Chester Fair poster uh, exhibits a lot of uh, wood type, uh, which was always a fascination with us. And in fact, uh, uh, that was the inspiration for the cover of the book, because you'll see that throughout a lot of the examples. Um, the um, uh, uh, wood type is something that uh, we, we we loved from the from the moment we were in art school, and we used to do a lot of hand printing and posters. And I did use uh, a lot of wood type in the, um, in the materials that we designed for Chester, the Meeting House Players, uh, Spoon River Anthology was one that I recall very, uh, very vividly, that uh, the texture of wood uh, and the, uh, the style of that particular period adds a, adds a wonderful character. And uh, this was a natural, this was uh, uh, not that uncommon uh, at that particular time. Uh, the other thing that impressed us was the, uh, the wit and the uh, sophistication of some of the pieces. This was a, a high school play, and the play on words, uh, Arrival by Request, uh, the, the double entendre thing <laughs> we thought was so amusing. Uh, and also the, uh, the printing techniques. Uh, this was a graduation program. We used this for stamping, uh, engraving, uh, 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 letterpress printing, which was uh, the, the standard model uh, at, at that particular time, but compared to um, you know laser printed programs today, and even online programs, it, uh, the, the texture and the quality uh, and the tactile aspect of, uh, of these pieces were were um, a different a different experience. Uh, speaking of touch, the theme that Jan mentioned before. Now we need to um, mention Rob Maselli, who's been so wonderfully active in the, in the historical society. And I understand, uh, Rob, you're doing a program in the summer with kids. Well, and he's also written a book with his brother, which I believe is also on sale here and at the museum. It just 
just won an award of merit from the state. It's a big deal. <laughs> just conceiving of this idea. Rob generously um, brought over a bunch of this ephemera from his own collection. And uh, I was able to feature two, and they are on this, two of his J.J.A. O'Connor advertising cards. Mm -hmm. Those wonderful <laughs> illustrations. And then more of his advertising cards promoting Mrs. H. G. Scoville and J. L. Stark, as well as six Award of Merit cards, which was Al's expertise. Um, six of Rob's Award of Merit cards can also be seen on the, um, the uh, educational learning sections. And we, you'll say where the building is? Going back. Oh yeah. Well, one of the um, <coughs> one of the interesting things you know about so many of the postcards is how little has changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, J.J. Yeah. Yeah, so. O'Connor was in that building on the. Uh, it's Sarah. Yeah, yeah I found okay. I found that in the wall when, yep. when I was <laughs> remodeling. Mm -hmm. well, I have several copies of well I had, but. Um, yeah, they were left in the wall when they cleared out, I guess. It's 1880, but it was, it, I laughed because they got the year wrong, so they penned in 1886 on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, as beautiful as it was, I was glad to see that other people make little errors. That piece is a great example, Al always loved it, um, of a broadside, it's called, you know, great big poster size, it's called a broadside in ephemeral language. And, Ephemerists are always looking for those. They're selling them because they're they're fancy. They're expensive. Mm -hmm. So they're going out of business. Yeah, they're fancy. <laughs> now the other happy surprise was when almost forgotten, but I looked through, pulled through the um, our own archives on our computer, our backups, and all that, and rediscovered um, scans of postcards that actually we had an intern in our office back in 2003 when we found these postcards. And um, I was stunned because we had, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 of them, some including the backs of the cards. And Peter will tell us to well, how this all came about. Yes, when we were uh, putting the addition onto our building, uh, I received a call from a, a collector by the name of Bi uh, uh, Bruce Rayner, who lived on Wig Hill Road. And he informed me, he says, we have a, a, a post office box unit from the original post office, which was in our building from 38 to 65. Uh, and uh, it was for sale. He, he had one left. He, um, uh, he bought out the old post office and, and broke down those units and sold them as banks. It was a thing to do. And he had one left, and uh, we said, certainly, we'd love to uh, purchase it. And went out to see his collection and uh, acquired uh, the post office box unit, which we uh, donated to the historical site. It's in the lobby. Uh, went from our lobby to the lobby of the, of the Mill Museum. And um, we noticed that he had so many other things, including an album of Chester postcards. And we were, we had never seen any of the images before, so we asked if we could borrow it. And as Dan mentioned, we, um, we happened to have an intern that was free, and we scanned all the photographs. And those became some of the ones that are included in this book, probably published for the first time, uh, I believe. And, uh, Diane was very careful to catalog them, although we don't have the original images, but uh, I mean the uh, postcards, but we do have the uh, the images that have been saved. And this is one of the most fascinating ones on, on this spread. It's a fire at a witch hazel factory. I had never even known we had actually a witch hazel factory right here in Chester. And that this was a postcard that um, we had never seen. Diane, I don't think you had ever seen the postcard. No? Um. I had seen a copy of the photograph, but not the postcard. Okay. And this was uh, 
the witch hazel factory was located on the sharp corner after the gas station, you know, leading up toward the sharp house. It was on that sharp corner. That's where it was. Up until the 19, late tw 1920s. Okay, and this is just a little, a little aside, but you know, one of the challenges of how do you put a book together? And where, what things do you, uh, how do you organize it? So I kind of looked at all the various images and decided these categories that some are pretty obvious and some are for this particular book. So we had uh, the calling cards, in introductions and invitations, then we had events and celebrations. <laughs> teaching, learning, and awarding, goods and services, business and industry, hunting and playing, <laughs> the war years, and then reminders of bygone days, and then remembering the Wangots. <laughs> Just coming up <coughs> with done for a little while. <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk about those books, Peter. Well, uh, some of the uh, items are, are just fascinating by their, uh, their content and the, and the calligraphy. Uh, this is beautiful. You can see the date. It's 1834. And uh, the, the, the commentary as well. And also, uh, you'll notice in some of the ledgers, the prices of items, which are uh, shockingly uh, uh, low compared to our, our times, even, even with the uh, uh, Accommodations of time and so forth. Um, Diane, do you have background on, on any of these on the book? Um, this is a book that uh, came from the uh, Solomon Factory, Solomon Company. Um, it was soon after they started, and it was um, the time book. So it gave on, on each page there was the name of the person who worked there, and apparently how many hours or how much he produced. Um, and this is 1937, I mean 1837, so it was early on. Um, Silman made the ink wells, ink stands. Um, he started the company in the 1830s, so it was only a year or so into it when um, this book was, was started. But we have a lot of the books. We ended up with a, a museum up in Massachusetts, ending up with a lot of a lot of books, and they donated them to us, so that was great. We have a, a lot of books about Silva. And I know see, you have, you know about. Uh, this is one of our favorite photographs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think the caption could be round up the usual suspects. <laughs> but uh, men uh, with their dogs and their guns uh, and, uh, and their, their prey. Um, and Diane told us the little girl was on the left. <laughs> so I just learned yesterday, I think. Well, the hunting license is from um, Fred Walden, and he's pictured in there with the gun and his little daughter in the, in the, uh, in the picture, and that's um, <laughs> Helen Raffuse, who some of you may have known. Listed himself as a peddler, 23 years old. Yes. Maybe he was peddling uh, raccoon hats. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have others? Yeah. And then okay, the other ones are um, Joe Morrill, James Henry, Eddie Costelli, Leighton Kelsey, um, Tony Calamari with a question mark, <laughs> uh, Bill Bowling, um, Ocean Ray. Fred Walden and Helen and Father Custer, who's the priest locally. <laughs> and then going forward to the warriors, um, Diane just had so many, so much information about a lot of these documents. Well, the um, first one from the Grand Army of the Republic, which was an organization for veterans, which was started right after the Civil War. Um, and this particular, um, it's the charter for the Chester um, post of the uh, Grand Army of the Republic, and it has a bunch of familiar names on it. Um, Walter Clark, 
uh, Henry Gardner, Asilliman, Gorham, Nelson Gilbert, Shipman, Wright. And if you look at the plaque that's up in the balcony of the Civil War volunteers, most of those are on that plaque. Um, it's interesting because the, the man who found it, Ted Urbanski, he's from Wellington, and he found it in a book in a restaurant. There's a restaurant out there that has books that you take and, and bring books. And he opened a book, and this was sitting there. And he's part of a reenactor group, Civil War reenactors. So he brought it down to us on a, you know, Fourth of July weekend in 2014, in with several of his reenactor friends in full costume, and presented it to us, which was really fun. And the picture. The picture on the lower left is um, Corporal Harry Houtling, who was killed on the last day of World War I, Armistice Day, so. And those are Civil War veterans, right? In the, in the car, in the parade, too. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's also Okay, the, the, the soldier in the postcard, that's actually a postcard, um, is Cliff Seveny, Clifford Seveny, and he went by Kip most of the time. Um, he had the distinction of being in both World War I and World War II. He um, enlisted in World War I when he was about 20. Um, he trained and went overseas. Um, he arrived in Europe in late October of, two, uh, of 1918, so he did not actually, he was not actually in a battle, but he was there for a month or so before the armistice. And then he came home, he's worked as a carpenter, and he was drafted for World War II. Um, he was in the State National Guard, and then he was in the um, regular army also. And we have quite a few different things from him, this draft card, and we have uh, copies of some of his um, discharge papers and things like that, so. I was fascinated, too, by the postcard that apparently the soldiers are given to fill out, and then when they make it overseas, then the postcard is sent to the parents or loved ones that they Right, because they would have gone over, you know, it would have taken many days to go on a ship and be yeah. sent overseas and to make sure that they got there safely. The, um, the picture of the soldiers marching, that's the, through the center of town. Um, one of those is um, Tyler, Tyler Smith. Um, he graduated from Chester High School and went off into the service. And what's interesting is the way we ended up getting this picture. Um, he ended up living in Durham most of his life. And after when the family was cleaning up the house, they put all the pictures and all the ephemera that he had in a couple of boxes and left it at the dump. And somebody came along and figured out it belonged in Chester and found somebody, um, Barbara Kish, who they knew she was originally from Chester, they gave it to her and she brought it to me. So we have lots and lots of pictures from the um, Smith and Emmons families and we have all the letters that his parents wrote to him every day he was in the service. And this picture, which on the back says, the last time we were all together. Well, let that be a lesson to you. Don't be packing up your stuff and leaving them at the dump, because for one thing, somebody's gonna look through them and find out you <laughs> threw them out. <laughs> Secondly, we need them. <laughs> Um, this is the war ration book. I don't know, many of us don't remember even having war ration books, but our parents do. <laughs> and this belonged to Hattie Pratt, who was the daughter of Dr. Ambrose Pratt, who fought in the Civil War and was a local doctor. Um, and the cards on the other part are from Hugh Spencer. He was an artist and a photographer in town. In fact, some of the iconic pictures of Chester that we have postcards available were taken by Hugh Spencer. Um, and he also designed these different Christmas cards every year. 
and um, actually Hattie Pratt was his aunt. So, and thank you to Don for bringing these po these Christmas cards to us. Yes, this is a uh, Hugh Spencer postcard that he took probably in about 1913 or 14, I forget. Yeah, and then uh, what's terrific about uh, some of the cards is the back of the cards. It's so fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'd like to read this one because it's a little hard to read on the screen. Um, it's Postmark Deep River, Connecticut. 4 p.m. July 1st, I can't read on the back of it what the exact year, but it's to Mrs. M.B. Medley, M.M. Life Insurance Company, Springfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And this woman is saying, queer, they should call this Cedar Lake. Picture seems to be mostly a tumble down house. <laughs> Anyhow, it is on the road to where I am staying, four miles from the center. Have you finished canning your strawberries yet? <laughs> All from Ada. <laughs> no, I mean, it just gives you such a sense of the way people would talk with each other or whatever, just like we do, in <laughs> a casual way, whatever. And then these two pages are especially noteworthy because all four items are new acquisitions to the archives. You From you, thank you. Uh, the bottom, uh, the bottom left uh, is um, a photograph of uh, in front of the, of the stone building uh, with uh, two tokens for the pool hall that used to be in that building on the second floor, actually where I had my office, <laughs> and uh, I could hear the pool balls breaking uh, you know, when I was daydreaming. So but um, that was given to us by Jesse Lanzi, who had a, a fascination with history and, and actually bequeathed uh, several uh, pieces to, uh, uh, to us over the years um, that we uh, were happy to give to the Historic Society. You know, and honestly, the upper left one, which is such a kick, I, it's not one of the postcards that we have scanned, and I don't know where the heck I found it somehow. I was researched in Chester and found that one. But the other, the other, there, that's actually two photographs, two postcards on the right. Um, they're both um, scans, they're both new ones that you know we have scanned. But I had to show the two different ones because first of all, I love the dog in the snowbank, it's quite unusual. And the back of the other one, postmark, Chester, July 25th, 1927, to Miss May Green, Essex, Connecticut. <laughs> Dear May, I promise you I would write, but I can't think of much to write. <laughs> I am so nervous I can't write, <laughs> but write just the same. <laughs> I was down Sunday afternoon, but no one was home. With love, Russell. <laughs> By the computer, right? <laughs> they would mail this. I just think it's it's so dear that he would write this and send it to to May. I don't know. Does anyone know anything about who May and Russell were? <laughs> no. Jan, how much is this stamp? How much is the postage? Oh, what is it? Is it two cents? Yes. Two cents. Yeah. Well, the, the, the thing about uh, this book, whole book, as we were going through it. Um, made us realize that uh, most of the people, first of all, in the book are deceased. And uh, they led lives very similar to ours. They, they, um, they raised their children, they educated them, they, they worked hard, they, uh, they had dinner parties, they, had, they made music, they celebrated parades, uh, and they lived their lives uh, very, very much the way we do. And we're very grateful because they took care of the town. They did, they left the town uh, for us to, uh, to enjoy. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a very uh, human experience to, uh, to think of the, the
the continuity. Anyway, that was uh, now also speaking about that that wonderful comment, Peter. I realized that we've only focused on people like us, right? The, the familiar with. And so my, this now my discovery is just so wonderful. Um, well into the search, I revisited the society's website to study additional YouTubes. <laughs> Most helpful for my purposes was Don Peral's 220 presentation. Before the English arrived, Native Americans in Chester. An exciting surprise to me, especially the tiny book he held in his hands. The tiny, the tiny book. It, yeah, that's it's. Uh, first, I have to say it's it's up to this point. It's been great watching because, you know, I'm a I'm a I'm a local boy and grow grew up in this town when it was small and and. You know, there were still a lot of factories, and in the summertime, your mother would kick you out of the house at 8 o'clock in the morning and say, see you at lunch, and, and you would just wander around the town and, and, and wander through old factories that were still here. You probably shouldn't have gone through those factories. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, and even some of the people up there you, you look at, and I think I've always had such a fascination with Chester history, and um, especially with Native Americans, and, and this is where Jan comes in. You know, my grandparents owned a house two houses up from the Middletown Yacht Club. And uh, it was their summer home until they came up here permanently in the late 40s. And they had been there for a couple of decades. And it was kind of interesting because as they would um, do work on the house or dig out the garden, they would dig up projectile points, dig up Indian artifacts. Even my mother, my, I shouldn't give away her age, but my 80-something-year-old mother will talk about how when they were digging the potato garden and up popped a skull out of the ground. So they put it right back down in there, and the potato patch was going to go elsewhere. And um, so I always had this fascination with Chester um, history. But it wasn't until one day when I came across this, this book, which we've reproduced here, that I was really just taken aback. The Chester Historical Society has in its collection um, this wonderful book that was written by Edward Hungerford, a great piece of ephemera. And, um, and I love ephemera. I have collected ephemera all my life. It all started with this like grandmother of mine who had been the town treasurer for 20 years and you know uh, she used to just have all these little piece, little pieces of this paper and postcards and not that she was a collector. Um, as a matter of fact she was kind of a neat freak but um, I used to love to look at this stuff you know and stuff that related to factories and stores and it just kind of showed what a you know kind of filled in the, the, the glue kind of that uh, told us about this town. But it was this book that someone showed me once. I've only ever seen one copy of this book, and I assume it's the one that the Historical Society has. And it was written by a man named Edward Hungerford, who wrote this book, I, I believe, in the 1870s. And um, he wrote it about the Native Americans that lived in our town. And it is just the most, I mean, it's really incredible. Not that I'm trying to give you a pitch to buy this book, but um, this is a reproduction of it. But in this book, he's, now first of all, Edward Hungerford's a warner. So he talked, and his warners are the earliest settlers of Chester. And uh, he talks in this book about, you know, when he was a young boy in the early 19th century, how his uncle talked to him about playing amongst the old abandoned Indian fort on top of the hill by the Chester Ferry, which was known as Fort Hill. Um, which people here tonight live there and, and live on that hill. And it was just a magnificent. And, and he goes through and describes the Native Americans in a children's story um, of going around, you know, around the town. And it, it, for me as a young boy, it really brought to life that there had been people living here before we did. We all know this, for example, you know, in the winter they'd go out by Cedar Lake and pitch their wigwams out there. That's where the name Wig Hill Road comes from because the Hill Road came right down there to where the wigwam was, that area called Wigwam Hollow. Um, but this book is just enchanting. And it, it, for me, it led to a lifelong fascination with these Native Americans. My dad and I used to tool around when I was a little boy, like we're talking four and five years old in the late 60s, and we would go look for 
arrowheads, he'd projectile points, and he knew right where to find them. Not just in my grandparents' yard, but you know, down by the Chester Ferry, you can used to be able to find them. In the Chester Fairground parking lot, after a real hard winter, the frost would push up the uh, projectile points out of the ground, and, and, and um, so a lot of people in town had these great collections of this stuff. Um, what I've enjoyed doing, and I've been blessed to, to have taught at Valley Regional in town, you know, for over 30 years, um, what I've loved doing over the years is taking this beautiful piece of ephemera, talking to all these old timers when I was growing up, and really then starting to put the history to the places. And I think that's the beauty of Chester, and I really think that's what the ephemera does for us. The ephemera, whether it be this, all the stuff we've looked at up to this point, or even this little book, the ephemera kind of is the fabric of our history. It's really what tells us, like Peter said, it tells us about the common man. It tells us about what we were buying, what we, you know, what we, what we did on the weekends, what clubs we belonged to, the letters we sent home, or even going off to war in those letters you sent home. In the Historical Society collection, I mean, we just have the most amazing material. You know, we have a diary in the 1840s of Albert Wright. I mean, he talks about building the Silliman factory, which is at the good speed of Chester today. He talks about going over to the iron foundry, which at that particular time, I think, would have been Russell and Beach. He talks about making repairs to the factory. We have an 1860 election, I mean, an 1860, um, I could call it a poster, I guess it's not a poster, but it's an 1860 listing of all the eligible voters in the town of Chester, and that's Abraham Lincoln's election. And I used to, I used to look at that sometimes and, and, and be, first of all, mesmerized that this was saved. I couldn't understand why this was saved, where other ones would not have been saved, until, until I realized it. I was doing some research recently, and Diane was helping me, and Martin Daniels was also, we've been working on some stuff, and I realized, you know, we found some documents, some ephemera in our collection, that we have a strong abolitionist movement in this town. And we, the Underground Railroad, went right through here. I always knew, because I know a couple houses, I used to play in one of them where they hid the slaves, here in Chester, but to actually see the paper, to see the documents in our collection, and then you know why they saved that 1860 election. Because even though they didn't know at that time that Lincoln would later be assassinated and that war would bring an end to slavery, they all came out and voted in that 1860 election knowing that Abraham Lincoln was their hope, was their hope to save the Union. It's really great stuff that we have um, in our, you know, some of the smallest things. You know, the little picture of, of Isaiah's World War I pictures up there, and I can think of this 1890s photograph of this little boy, his brother, his sister, in a little wagon right on Main Street from Memorial Day Parade. They must be six and seven years old, so proud. And it's Johnny Alexander, Charlie Alexander, and Leotide. I remember them when I was a young boy, 90 years old. Or, you know, they were ancient, and I used to mow his lawn, and oh my God, he used to paint me like, Three dollars to mow this terrible, endless lawn. My mother said. My mother would say, "It's in character. You need to go do that." But uh, but when I look at that picture, and Johnny Alexander was killed in the war, and that's what the uh, um, you know he's buried up in Laurel Hill. And every time I go by Laurel Hill and I go by his grave, and there's Charlie and Leotide buried next to him, and I think that little photograph, or a great piece of ephemera, and think, you know, he didn't get to live the life he wanted. And when I look at that picture, you can still imagine. That's the beauty of it, it really is. And um, I really find, again, scraps of paper tell a story. They really do. For me, I cannot tell you what this book, this book on Native Americans did. Um, it really brought, uh, for me, a passion. You can see the copy of the historical studies. It's the only copy I've ever seen. Never seen another one um, in existence, and I've searched high and low. Um, and you can find amazing things. I was in an ephemera shop. I can't get a history teacher microphone. I was in, I was in, an, I was in an antique shop in Maine 10 years ago, 12 years ago. You know, my wife's with the kids nap. The kids are napping in the car. I'm inside. I come across a, a stereo optic car. It says Chester, Connecticut Opera House in the back. I'm looking at it. I'm like, what are they talking about? What is this? And, and I'm looking at it. And I wasn't going to buy it, I was going to put it back for you, I was wrong. And finally I realized it's the interior shot of this room in 1876, wow. when it had just been finished. It's amazing that society has a copy of it now. But gosh, think of that. It's the only interior picture 
interior picture in this room until it happened to Jane was filmed in the 1950s. And I think that's the beauty of this book is that um, what Peter and Jan did was they just showed you not, I mean, it's beautiful stuff. It's great to look at, but it's the very fabric of our history. It tells us who we are. So um, I'm, a, I'm a family junkie. I, mean, <laughs> I could talk about Chester history forever. Any of you that know went to Valley Regional, which many of you did, you know, I, um, I uh, have Leon Lukey for local history. And Leon Lukey was a teacher that taught there for 20, 30 years. And I was a Chester boy who loved Chester history when I took that local history class. Um, I just fell in love more with the history, and then I was, I've been blessed for, what, 30 some odd years to be teaching that course, so uh, it's a great town. It really is. <laughs> That's all I have to say. arrowheads actually were um, found, not arrowheads, tools, were found when they were constructing, constructing Route 9 um, in Chester. And at that point, they were given to Deep River Historical Society because Chester did not have a historical society at that point. And then at some point, Deep River Historical Society kindly sent them back to Chester. So thank you, Deep River. <laughs> And I just have to add, it's, it's, it's not even that they just even found these randomly. They actually came across near Pine Ledge areas. They came across the actual site where the Native Americans made them. I mean, there was lots of shrapnel, broken pieces. It was the actual site where they would work on their tools and make them. And a lot of those broken pieces, um, you know, would just be tossed aside when they messed up and they'd have to start over again. So it, yeah, they came across, I mean, good. Back then, if it was today, they would have shut that site down for a month. <laughs> yeah. I have to tell you, too, I got so excited. Um, I had, uh, obviously, I brought them home to photograph them. Actually, they're, they're the only items that have natural shadow, all the other shadow in the book is, is computer shadow. But um, uh, our grandchildren were visiting, and I said, you have to hold these. Um, feel, feel how they, they feel good in your hands. You know, and they, these have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years, and, and they were right here by, by the people who lived here. And just, to be able to just touch those. And they're here, too, if anyone wants to come up and take a look. And I guess it's okay with you, Diane, if they, if they touch the, the, the stone tools. So going forward, we're gonna, we're almost out of town, we don't well, we but we, we wanna tell you quickly about our, our little, um, the way we work together. I think people who don't know us as well as close friends think that, oh, they don't have any troubles, they don't fight, they don't have disagreements. <laughs> They're so close and they work so well together. Well, we do work well together, but it's because of those our conflicts and because of our different sensibilities. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the cover, first of all, uh, we've done many covers, and uh, uh, there's basic functions of a co cover. The, the graphic should reflect something about the content of the book, and it also should be uh, compelling enough that someone wants to open the book and find out more. Uh, so we chose to use the word ephemera, which we, we, we love the sound of it, the phonics of it. Uh, it's, it's not a, a common word, but uh, if it's uh, interesting enough, people are going to pursue uh, trying to understand it. And uh, getting back to woodblock type, uh, that's the, the, the essential form of it. 
Um, but you can see the different uh, uh, sketches showing different ways of, 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 of presenting it. In other words, it could be um, based on the syllables, uh, or it could be uh, the mathematical uh, imperative that we actually chose, uh, the nine units, which gives it a sense of symmetry and so forth. And um, uh, we achieved that by, by adding the, uh, the exclaim, or in typographic terms it's called the bang, uh, and also uh, 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 makes the statement of the uh, of film that can be exciting, and we think it is. Uh, now the, the 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 fonts were 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 basic fonts that were based on uh, the uh, wood type, but they were not actually wood type letters, and they needed a lot of manipulation. So that's when I went to um, our production company <laughs> department, which is uh, essentially Jan. <laughs> so meanwhile. <laughs> Peter comes up with these brilliant ideas and solutions very, very quickly. And he's anxious to see it take form. <laughs> Meanwhile, I am researching. I'm running back and forth with Dr. Diane, laying out the book. How do we do this? And fascinated with the material, but thinking, oh man, I don't know if I can think about this cover right now. I can't think about it right now. I have to feel good about the book coming together and so forth. And, uh, and so in the back of my mind, oh, no, I know he wants me to do this. And anyone, anyone who works with InDesign or Illustrator knows it can be a real hassle to find all the fonts. Yeah. You know, you go in your suitcase, and do we have them, and can I find them? So I, when finally I felt pretty good about getting most of the book somewhat resolved, I said, okay, okay, I'll do this, let's sit down, I'm looking. And he's written down all the names of the fonts and so forth. And I'm thinking, does it have to be nine fonts or nine different letters? <laughs> At one point I said, I don't think this is going to work. And I said, you're torturing me right now. <laughs> what happened? But because, especially since we've left the building, I've had a lot more time to familiarize myself with all of the programs and so forth. And it, it was not a big deal to do that. And putting them, and you can see, if you look at the gray and um, white version, you can see the actual fonts did need some manipulation, a lot of manipulation. stretching, and so forth. <laughs> and, but the, the best thing about having waited so long is that I was really familiar with a lot of the most fun, colorful imagery, representative imagery. So once once I got that into um, Illustrator, uh, and I had Peter sit, sit with me, um, because he used to use this kind of technique before you could do it in a computer. You had to do it by hand. So I wanted him to see how easy and fun it was. That was for me, that was the fun part. <laughs> to find that imagery and plop it into uh, those letter forms and realize you know, that it was going to be a really fun, sensational cover. The nice thing about being naive about the production is that uh, it doesn't bother me to come up with these ideas. <laughs> Someone will get it done. <laughs> but, I, but, but I do have to be gentle. I'm about to press, though. I can't. I used to have an assistant, but I, yeah, just do it. <laughs> no longer true. Uh, no, we're just about okay. closure. So, thank you all for being here. We hope that our book and its stories have encouraged a new or renewed interest in ephemera. Yes. If so, we suggest that someday when you're home, search your house from attic to basement for your family's history. Mm -hmm. Appreciate and care for whatever you find or are already familiar with. Meanwhile, please keep in mind that Diane Lindsay 
and Pat Kosky. Why don't you stand up? <laughs> <laughs> excellent care of any Chester-related memories you're willing to contribute to the Historical Society. Barbara and Edmund would be delighted. Thank you all so much for coming.